Well, good morning. We are glad that you continue to join KMCC through the online service, and, and we trust that the messages are beneficial to you and to your family. Uh, as we study through the history of the early church, as recorded in the book of Acts, we are reminded through the narrative of how the early church grew and how it thrived. And three things that spurred their growth were corporate worship, fellowship with other believers, and generosity. And if you consider KMCC to be your home church, I would encourage you to please consider how you can more fully enter into these bases of Christian uh, fellowship. First of all, worship by reading your Bible and praying daily and continue to join us for these online worship services each and every week. Number two, fellowship with other believers by emailing or texting or calling the staff and elders or even some friends here at KMCC. We would love to hear from you and to pray for you. And lastly, practice generosity by giving financially to the ministry of KMCC. Your financial gifts make it possible for us to continue to give this offering to you on a weekly basis. So please know that we continue to pray for you all. And uh, as you watch us online, if you have benefited from the services, we would encourage you to please pass along the word to your friends and family so they can join us as well. Be encouraged in the goodness of our God. All right, I'm going to ask Petra to come on up and read for us this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Acts 2, 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at the sound of the multi as the this sound of the multitude came together, they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. Thank you, Petra. Appreciate it. All right. Okay, so the past few weeks we have looked at some pretty important and incredible truths from Acts. On week one, we learned that God is at work. And then on week two, we saw that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And then last week, uh, we were encouraged with the fact that nothing hinders God's plan. So today, the theme of the message dovetails with the theme from two, uh, week two because it is the account of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to send the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power and love and self-control. So today, we're looking at how Luke records the coming of the Holy Spirit, a prophecy that went all the way back to ancient times in the Old Testament. And what we're going to find is that God gave us the indwelling spirit of truth, the indwelling spirit of truth. Uh, we read a passage from Isaiah a few weeks ago, and we're going to read it again this morning as a reminder of what God is doing, and, and he has always been doing, building his kingdom here on earth. So I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 43. You can turn there if you would like. You don't have to. Uh, Isaiah chapter 43 in verse 5 starts like this. Fear not, for I am with you. Now, what kind of spirit did God give us? We learned this a couple weeks ago, right? Not the spirit of fear. And right here he says, fear not, for I am with you. All through scripture we see God telling his people, do not fear, I am God, I have everything under control. And Jesus said the same thing when he was on earth. We saw this all through the book of Mark. The disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, believers in the way, those with the indwelling Holy Spirit are not to be afraid. 
Why? Because God is at work. So check it out. In verse 5 to 7 of Isaiah chapter 43. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So, so God himself promised that he would bring together all peoples. And then we look at Acts 2, the verses that we just had read to us, where all the people were from, right? They were from all over the known world. Every nation under heaven, Luke says. Luke did not have to list out all these places, but he did. Why? To remind the Jews of God's promises way back in the Old Testament and that God was in the process of fulfilling these promises. Verse 9, he continues, All the nations gather together. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, there shall be Uh, Neither shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So all the nations gathered together. God was fulfilling his promise on the day of Pentecost, and all the nations were gathered there in Jerusalem. God has always had a heart for all the nations, for all of his creation. He loves the whole world, and he wants everyone to call upon his name for salvation. And in verse 10 in in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 43, it says, "'Who among them can declare the former things?' Well, we're going to find out next week that Peter and the apostles are declaring the former things. And we're going to go through Peter's sermon next week. And he says, you are my witnesses. So they were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, of God's unfolding prophetic plan. And what they were witnessing, here's what they were witnessing to. He is God. And that there's no salvation besides him. And what was the purpose of them declaring these truths? Why were they to witness of God's salvation, his gospel message, his good news? So that, in verse 9, they would say, it is true. And so that they would know and they would believe. It's been the same thing over and over again. Repentance and belief. It's true. It's belief in Jesus. Belief that God is the only means of salvation. Over and over through Scripture, we see it. And Isaiah will continue later on in in chapter 43. In verse 18, he'll say, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, for behold, I am doing a new thing. And now it springs forth, do not perceive it, for I will pour out my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. So he foretold what was going to happen on Pentecost, and here it was happening in Acts chapter 2. So the words of Isaiah and Joel we looked at a few weeks ago, and Ezekiel were actually coming true on Pentecost. Ezekiel 36 said this, I will remove the heart of stone from within from within you and put your heart of flesh inside of you. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So God's God's telling us what he's going to do and now he's doing it. And we've been talking about how God had promised through the prophets to restore Israel, remember? And last week we learned that for Israel to be properly restored, completely whole, all 12 tribes need to be represented and reunited. This is why the disciples filled the vacant role by Judas, remember? And Israel was to be united in one kingdom under the reign and rule of the heir of David's throne, and that would be Jesus. And we saw that God fulfilled his promises to Israel by sending Jesus. Jesus was the promised son of David, the heir to the throne. He called the 12 disciples. He healed the deaf and gave sight to the blind. And he is also the son of God, the savior, the redeemer of mankind. He's the Lord of all. And we see all this. And all this to say, this account in Acts chapter 2, on that infamous day of Pentecost, marked the fulfillment of Israel's long-awaited restoration. God fulfilled his promises to Israel, but then it was also way more than that. For the first time in history, God's Spirit was going to permanently reside in the hearts and lives of men and women. And this was unprecedented. But why the day of Pentecost? So it says that on the day of Pentecost, when it arrived, okay? So so what's the day of Pentecost all about? Pentecost is known also as the Feast of Weeks, and it's a Jewish holiday. and occurs exactly 50 days after Passover, Originally, God commanded Israel to celebrate this one-day harvest festival to remember his faithfulness to provide for them, for their needs, for their food. It has been suggested, though, that the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, was also associated with God's giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai 
when the people had come out of Egypt and they went to Mount Sinai millennia earlier. So it is believed that 50 days after they left Egypt, the children of Israel found themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai and received the law of God from Moses' hand. And Pentecost was the holiday to celebrate and remember God giving them the law. But what is so cool about this particular uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is that God, in his amazing grace, he repurposed the holiday, which originally celebrated the receiving of the law and made it a day to remember and celebrate the coming of the Spirit to indwell mankind. Instead of a strictly Jewish celebration of receiving the law, all those who believe, both Jew and Gentile, can celebrate the receiving of the indwelling spirit of truth, which gives us freedom in Christ Jesus. So it was that much more. And now as we work through the passage, the points in the outline are going to correspond to the three actors in this, in this incredible, uh, important story. So each, each actor is also a prophetic fulfillment. So you have the apostles, and then you're going to have the Holy Spirit and the nations. So you'll see your outline there in your notes. So point one, the apostles waited. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. So they were together. Now who's the, the they? It was the 12, but also the 120 from verse 15. So there's at least 120 people that are waiting. And they're obedient because Jesus told them to go and to wait. And this day, the ordinary became extraordinary because of the arrival of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, Emmanuel is God with us, and, and now it became God in us. And the disciples, though, they were sitting in that room waiting, but they did not have a plan. They did not have a strategy for reaching the world. They knew Jesus told them to tell everyone, but they didn't have a strategy for how to do that. They were promised by Jesus that they would be witnesses of him throughout the world, but that they were not responsible for how that was to be accomplished. They were responsible to be obedient witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And then the Holy Spirit was going to take everything from there. He was going to empower them. He was going to soften hearts. He was going to cause people to hear the apostles' witnesses in their heart language and bring people to repentance. So when we wait on the Spirit, He orchestrates events, empowers, emboldens, and enables us to do what only He can accomplish. As I was thinking through this, I was gently reminded by the Spirit this week that that we as self-sufficient and independent Christians in the West need to rely less upon our own plans and strategies and consultants and professionals and advertisements and manipulating techniques for producing converts. Instead, we should focus our time on prayerfully waiting upon and looking to the guidance of the Holy Spirit to move mightily in making disciples as we simply witness to the power of Jesus' resurrection. And I was reminded of that this week. And when I think about all the things that we, all the things we do, spinning our wheels, trying to get advertisements thing out there, when the Holy Spirit's involved, He's going to make it happen. And the Holy Spirit came in verse in chapter two, verse two through four. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now God is a very audio-visual God, a tactile God. He made the world. And all that's in it, all that we see and we touch and we taste and we smell and we hear, the physical things that he made were meant to be the medium by which we could see and taste and touch and feel and hear, in other words, to live out, work out, manipulate, manifest, realize what is spiritual. So the physical is meant to be a means of of working out and, and, and living out what is spiritually happening. In the Old Testament, God's presence was most often experienced in the physical sense as as fire and cloud and light. And what was on Mount Sinai when God intervened into history for the first time to, in essence, establish his kingdom through Israel? You're right. There was fire and smoke and loud sound like a trumpet. In the New Testament, God's presence was experienced when Jesus came in the flesh. He was, he was born, and he, he worked, and he ate, and he laughed, and he talked, and he died like the rest of us. And after Jesus rose and ascended to heaven, and when the foreordained time of his physical presence came to conclusion, God did something completely unheard of, completely new, completely unexpected, completely undeserved. 
he sent the Holy Spirit to reside inside those of us who believe. And when his Spirit came to establish his kingdom in our midst, to indwell inside of us, the physical manifestation of this event was reminiscent of God descending on Mount Sinai in fire and light and with a loud noise. Now we hear this, and we're like, oh, hum, that's cool, whatever. It's a nice story. And we fail to understand the magnitude of this truth, the the presence of the almighty, eternal God, which caused fear and trembling when he descended on Mount Sinai, that same presence now indwells us weak, frail human beings like you and me. And it is not a spirit of fear and trembling like it was, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. That's incredible. And Luke recorded this one-time event so that all readers, down to you and me, could hear about the inauguration of the Holy Spirit in dwelling human hearts and could find comfort in the fact that God's prophecies are true and he now dwells inside of us for sure. Now John the Baptist said back in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, he said, He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The word spirit in, in the Greek is an interesting word. It's, it's in the ancient Jewish mindset, the word for spirit, which is pneuma, carried the meaning of wind, and also of breath, and also of spirit. So wind and breath and spirit were all kind of intertwined in that one word. So notice what happens here. In verse 2, there's, there's a sound. There's a, there's a rushing wind. Now what is sound perceived by? I know, by the ears, right? And, and uh, what did Jesus always say when he was on earth? He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. God wants us to hear and to listen to him. When God decided to begin his new work in the lives of his people, there came the sound of a rushing wind so that they could hear and perceive that he was at work. And the word for wind can also mean breath. A mighty rushing breath came into the room. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the, the breath of his mouth, all their host. Ezekiel 1.4, listen, uh, listen how Ezekiel describes a vision of the glory of the Lord, which he saw. He said, a stormy wind, a mighty breath, and fire flashing forth continuously. Ezekiel 37, we all know about the valley of dry bones. God's wind, or his breath, comes into the valley of dry bones and gives them life. It's a, it's a picture of spiritually dead Israel and how God would raise them up again in an even broader spiritually dead humanity who God would put his spirit inside and raise us up again. It was reminiscent of this passage in in Acts chapter 2. And then Exodus 15, the song of Moses recounting God's saving power at the Red Sea. He says this, At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood up. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Literally, by the breath of your nostrils, and you blew with your breath. And then listen to John chapter 3, verse 8. Listen to this interesting thing that Jesus says. He says, The wind, or the breath, the Spirit blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit came in a way that could be heard. They heard the breath of God, the same breath that breathed out the cosmos, as the hill song, sa- song says, in the vapor of your breath, the planets were formed. Think of that. They heard this same breath in that room. God breathed. God spoke. And all that we see came into existence. And that same powerful, creative breath, Spirit of God, came upon the disciples in that upper room. And that same Spirit, breath of God, lives inside each one of us. To me, that's just incredible. And then we see that it came as dividing tongues of fire. And, what, and it was something they could see. And what is sight perceived through? Through the eyes. And what did Jesus always say? He who has eyes to see, let him see. So God wants us to see and perceive that he is at work. When God decided to begin his new work in the lives of his people, there appeared the sight of divided tongues of fire which rested on each of them so they could see and perceive that he was at work in their midst. And the fire rested on each one of them. That means that all 120 people in that place experienced this miracle. Luke is subtly drawing out parallels with the Old Testament. In Exodus 19, we take it back to the the Mount Sinai, and it said this, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in loud thunder. Exodus 24, 17, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of all the people. So God's a very audiovisual God. And then in 2 Chronicles, when, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, it says this, As soon as Solomon finished the prayer over the temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So the Spirit came and acts in such a way that it could be seen. The fire of the presence of the Lord appeared like it had in the burning bush or on Mount Sinai in the temple dedication. But in this instance, God did something different, unexpected. The fire of his presence didn't stay in one place and bring fear like it had before. No, this time the tongues of fire spread out and came to rest on each of those who were present. What was Mount Sinai called after this event in in Exodus? It was called the Holy Mount of God. And Mount Sinai became, became known as God's Mountain. And then what was the name for the room where the glory and fire of God dwelt inside the temple? The Holy of Holies. The temple became known as God's house. And what are believers called after they believe and are indwelt by the Spirit of God? The holy and blameless children of God. We, the church, have become known as the dwelling place of God. Isn't that interesting? Why is this spreading of fire significant? Because it is a picture of how God's presence is available to all who believe. And what this means is that there's no longer a divide between God and his people. When God came down to give the law, he came down in fire on top of the mountain, and people were not allowed to come closer to, than the foot of the mountain, or they would have been consumed because of their sinfulness. And when Solomon dedicated the temple, God's presence came down in fire and filled the Holy of Holies, and, but the people were never allowed beyond the curtain of the temple. Or they would have died because of their sinfulness. There's always been something between God and man. And that something was sin. But with Jesus, the temple curtain was split in two. And God ripped it from top to bottom. And Jesus took all the sins of the world upon himself. And he suffered the death penalty for all of us. And then rising from the dead, he made a way for all people to be cleansed and have access to God. When we sin weak, humans believe this, believe this truth. Not only can we approach God at any time, but he himself comes to indwell each one of us. And collectively, we are called the temple of God. What an incredible truth. And then it says that the Spirit filled them in verse 4. And I want you to notice this uh, when you read this passage. The Holy Spirit is the causing agent of all that happened to Pentecost. The sound of the wind, the sight of the fire, the filling of the disciples, the enabling of the disciples to speak in other languages, the hearing of the crowd in their own language, the congregating of the people of Jerusalem from every nation, the boldness of the disciples, all that was done by the Holy Spirit. It was all the work of the Spirit. And here's the point. Without the wind of God, nothing moves. Without the Spirit of God, Nothing changes. Without the breath of God, nothing comes alive. Without God, nothing happens. Do we want to see change in our nation, in our world, in our hearts? Do we want to see Jesus rule and reign on earth? It only happens when people put faith in Jesus, allowing the Spirit of God to enter and to rule and reign in their hearts and lives. And this can only happen when when we, those who believe, witness and proclaim the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection. And people come to faith because they hear and they see. And this is the plan of God. The kingdom of God and peace on earth comes through proclaiming the gospel. Not through legislation, not through protesting, not through boycotting, not through posting, not through arguing, not through convincing, not through winning court cases, not through creating movements, not through marketing and advertising, not through edicts or mandates, not through power or wealth. The kingdom of God is in our midst and it comes as we proclaim the message of truth. It's right here. It's right now. It expands. The gospel goes forth and the Spirit of God moves people to repentance and belief, removing their hearts of stone and replacing them with His Spirit, His breath inside of them. Now, for some reason, we don't want to believe it's that simple. I think I know the reason, though. It's because of the fact that we play such a tiny little role. 
We play such a tiny little role in it all. And God gets all the glory and all the credit and all the praise because he's actually the one who does it all. It's an ingenious plan. So the Spirit gives utterance. He was the source of truth spoken on Pentecost. Now these folks had not prepared or rehearsed their speeches. They simply went out of the room and began to speak about what Jesus had done. And as they did so, they were speaking intelligibly in known foreign languages. They were speaking in the native and heart languages of all the places that Luke lists in this passage. And and this is what is so amazing. Not that these folks were babbling in some unintelligible language that no one could understand. What was so amazing was that they were speaking in heart languages and dialects from around the world that a Galilean could not possibly have learned or known. And that's not because Galileans were incapable or they were dumb, but it's because Galilee was so far removed from these places and they had, didn't have access to learn these languages. And in my experience and through interaction with folks who have learned foreign languages, it typically takes two to six years to get to a point in a foreign tongue where you can speak at a level needed to, uh, to convey abstract realities like repentance and forgiveness and love and, and grace. Not two to six minutes. This was a miracle. And why was this such a miracle? Because in a moment's time, they were able in a foreign language to speak about the mighty works of God. In verse 11. And in this context, the mighty works of God they were testing to in a previously unknown language is, it goes to verse 22 in Acts chapter 2. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. And he continues. The mighty works of God were the things which he did through Jesus. And they were speaking of Jesus in a foreign tongue. The message that we, God's people, are to proclaim is the good news of the mighty works of God that he did through the person of Jesus Christ. When we speak of God, of his working among mankind, of his eternal purposes, of his power and his authority, it must always come back to Jesus. Jesus is the focal point of our description of who God is and what he does and how he works. Hebrews 1.1, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus. When we witness to the works of Jesus, both in the Gospels and in our own lives, we are speaking of the mighty works and words of God himself. We must speak of Jesus, for there is power in his name, and there is salvation in no other. Our final point. Chapter 2, verse 5 to 13, is these nations are gathered. Now the crowd's origin, notice that there's, there's devout Jews that were living in Jerusalem. These were pious, God-fearing Jews. Quite possibly these were Jews who had come back from all the places that are listed in order to live permanently in their homeland, to be part of their Jerusalem community. Maybe some of them came back to spend their final years living in the ancient city of their fathers. Others, like the proselytes who are mentioned, those who converted to Judaism, may have been in the city for the Feast of Weeks. Maybe these proselytes who believed were the ones that took the gospel back to Rome and established the church there. It's actually quite possible. But they were from every nation under heaven, Luke says. This might be hyperbole. It might be an exaggeration uh, to make a point because Luke doesn't necessarily list every single nation under heaven at that time. But perhaps he was listing a few in order to grab our attention to affirm that there were people literally from all over the known world who were gathered in Jerusalem on that day. And it wasn't an accident. And Luke lists the following nations, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites. This is actually modern-day Iran. And then Mesopotamia, this is modern-day Iraq. And then Judea and Cappadocia, it's modern-day Palestine and up to western Turkey. And then you had Pontus in Asia. These places were near the Black Sea and, and southern Russia. And then Phrygia and Pamphylia, these were located on eastern Turkey and along the Aegean Sea towards Greece. And then there's Egypt and Libya and Cyrene, that's, that's noted. Those are northern Africa is represented. And then, and then Rome, so all of Italy, Italy is represented. And then Cretans, they're from the island of Crete. Arabians from the Arabian Peninsula. So they're all over, and they're all coming here. It's interesting, he doesn't name Greece and he doesn't name Syria, even though there were lots of Jews in those places at that time. But this is Luke's way of demonstrating that Jesus was serious about the idea that the gospel is going to go forth to the ends of the earth. 
This wasn't a religion that would stay in Jerusalem. No, this was a movement of God's spirit which would forgive and save and adopt people into his kingdom from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, from all over the world. And it started with the Jews, devout Jews who came from all over the world. And then it spread to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles who were spread all over the world. And we're, we'll see how that happens in Acts chapter 10. But Luke lists all these nations right here after the disciples had received the indwelling Holy Spirit to show the fulfillment of Jesus' words just a few verses earlier. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And this definitely happened while they were in that room. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Right then and there, they were proclaiming the mighty works of God. And in Judea and Samaria, and those were represented in, those, in that crowd that was there, and to the ends of the earth, and there were men from every tribe that were there. If you don't know it yet, by the end of the book of Acts, you will be convinced that God has a heart for all nations. God so loved the world. We learned this when we were a kid, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loved Israel, yes, but God loved Israel and chose Israel because of his great love for the world. People from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And that is why God loves us and chose us, the church, because of his great love for the world. Now, the last thing I want to mention from this passage is the crowd's reaction. I love watching how people react to different things. And the greatest reaction can come when people have absolutely no category for what they're experiencing. In some situations, it can be terribly funny or humorous. In others, it can be very disturbing, the reaction. And here, in this situation, my guess is it was a mixture of the humorous and the disturbing. The crowd was bewildered. He uses uh, five words to describe their reaction. Bewildered, astonished, amazed, perplexed, and, and then there were some that mocked. So they were bewildered. They were disturbed in the mind. They were confused. They were led to almost an uproar. And then they were astonished. They, were, they, were, they had wonderment and marvel at what they were seeing. They were amazed. So they were astounded. They were out of their wits. They were kind of thrown into wonderment. How do we describe what we're seeing? And then they were perplexed. They were like in doubt. Am I really, am I really perceiving what's happening here? They were t entirely at a loss. And then some were mocking, and we'll get to that next week. But for now, something to glean from the response of the crowd is this. Bewilderment, perplexity, amazement, astonishment, and even mockery are common responses to the work of God. Humans don't have a category for it. And it is understandable because God's works are supernatural. You ever try to tell a story of what God did in your heart and people are kind of like, I, can't, I don't know how to put that into, into words, right? Those of us who have believed are here to explain the mysteries of God and the mighty works of God in a way that people can understand. We're to proclaim that Jesus is king. We're to proclaim that his kingdom has come. We're to proclaim what is true by the power of the spirit of truth that resides in us. Don't be surprised when you see varied responses to this message. It's natural. Most people, because they are born in sin and surrounded by the lies of the devil, do not know what to do with the truth when they first hear it. And that's what was happening on the day of Pentecost. And here's where we'll end. <clears throat> the topic of truth. And I just want to, I feel the need, the necessity of reminding us that truth is foundational to life. And the reason that I keep bringing up this concept of truth is because right now Satan is in an all-out war against truth. He's twisting facts. He's flooding us with information. He's bombarding us with so many voices, so much so that many of us find ourselves almost paralyzed. Like, what do we do? Where do we go for truth? There are false prophets, false pastors, false teachers, false reporters, false leaders. Who do we trust, right? And the answer is we go to the Word of God and we learn to listen to the Spirit of truth which resides inside of us. Listen to these important word, quotes from Jesus himself as he was preparing his disciples for this day of Pentecost when the spirit of truth would come. Listen to John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells in you and will be with you. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Where does the spirit of truth originate? From God. 
God is the source of all truth. He gives us the helper, the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth guides us into truth. In these confusing times where it seems uh, seemingly impossible to discern truth from falsehood, we need to listen to the spirit of truth inside of us. He guides us, and he does so through a very time-tested and very consistent way, through his word, the word of God. But that means what? That means we actually have to read it. We have to read it every single day. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are confused and upset and worried and tempted and anxious and fearful, but they don't read God's word. If you don't read it, then you will succumb to the lies and the temptations of the devil. You'll be duped. You'll be deceived. You'll be placed in bondage. You will be tripped up. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So it's not a joke. The ways of life and death are actually found in God's word, the truth of Jesus and the reality of the gospel. So we need to read God's word. And then how do we discern what is true and what is not? So, so we're reading God's word, but how do we still discern what coming, what's coming out of us if it's true or not? And here are two characteristics of truth. I would, I would encourage you to write them down. Number one, truth is unchanging. The spirit of truth will be with you forever. God's word abides forever. The gospel of Jesus doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Truth stays consistent. The times and the cultures and the legislators and the opinions and the rhetoric does, does, changes all the time. But truth cannot change. It cannot die because the truth, the spirit of truth is eternal. Truth is unchanging. And then number two, truth is narrow and specific. The world cannot receive it because it neither sees him nor knows him, Jesus said. If the broad spectrum of the world is rejecting something, it's probably because it's true. As Jesus said, for the gate, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. There's a place along one of the trails at Devil's Lake State Park that has a very narrow pass between two big boulders, and I cannot go through straight on. I always have to turn sideways to go through. And um, I know next year I probably won't be able to get through that way either. But, um, <laughs> but I always pictured the narrow gate that Jesus talks about as, as kind of like that. Those who want to enter must be lean and mean, right, to get through that, that, that narrow gate. But that's not what Jesus is necessarily getting at. Some translations use the word straight here to describe the gate. And what is a straight gate? I heard someone once describe placing their trust in Jesus as difficult. It was difficult in the sense that they had to let go of all other allegiances. They, had to make, uh, they made the point that they had to realize that they had no other backup plan. Jesus was it. And I was like, amen. That's, that, that's true. A straight gate... The way that's difficult is specific, it's precise, it's definite, it's unambiguous, it's unswerving. And many people like to keep their options open, but Jesus doesn't allow for this. It has to be unswervingly, precisely, specifically him and nothing else. So truth is narrow and it's specific. A few more things about truth, the spirit of truth which comes uh, the truth which comes from the spirit of truth. John 14, Jesus continues, The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Here are some characteristics of the spirit of truth. You can write these down too. The spirit of truth is patient. The Spirit will teach you all things. Now, teaching takes time. Many of us had this fact hit home this year as we've had to homeschool our own kids, right? Teaching takes time. Bringing remembrance takes patience. The Spirit of truth patiently, calmly, peacefully, unswervingly waits for people to listen and to hear. The Spirit of truth is patient. The Spirit of truth is, number two, nonviolent. 
It is peaceful. The helper brings peace. The father of lies, the devil, brings chaos and disorder, disintegration and destruction. The spirit of truth brings peace and unity. You want proof of that? Just look at our nation. Wherever you see chaos and destruction, it's fueled by the lies of the devil. Wherever you see peace, it's going to be fueled by the spirit of truth. The truth is found in God's word and the gospel of Jesus. And number three, the spirit of truth is unafraid. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The spirit of truth does not worry. It's not fearful of being found out, about being exposed, about any of the other things the world is fearful of. The spirit of truth is not concerned with being questioned or interrogated. Why? Because the spirit of truth is true. What you see is what you get. No deception, no inconsistencies. The spirit of truth is full of integrity and courage. And then one more verse with a few more characteristics of the spirit of truth. This indwelling spirit of truth. John 15. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So again, the spirit of truth proceeds from the Father. Because it has one source, The spirit of truth is unifying. Our nation, our world is talking about unity. We hear it all the time. Trying to find it around some sort of cause or whatever. But they never will find it. Why? Because only the spirit of truth brings unity. And that unity is centered around one person. One king. And his name is Jesus. Nobody else. Another one. Truth is consistent and universal. The spirit of truth witnesses about Jesus, and as a result, those who are indwelt by the spirit of truth also witness about Jesus to the ends of the earth. It's just that simple. The answer to the world's problems, the answer to sin and evil, the answer to destruction and division is simply faith in Jesus. Once we place our faith in Jesus, God gives us the indwelling spirit of truth, and his spirit changes us. And as a result, that changes society in the world. And as Christians, let's not forget where the power for change really comes from. Let's not forget the true hope of our salvation, and that's Jesus. And Jesus gave us this indwelling spirit of truth. Let's not neglect so great a gift. The spirit doesn't need social media or internet or apps, technology to spread the truth of the gospel. It does it by indwelling the hearts and lives of people and empowering them to witness to the nation's about the gospel of Jesus. Let's be faithful to share this great gift, the hope of the world, with people from all walks of life, even to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us the spirit of truth. We thank you that you've given us your word and that he speaks to us through your word. May we read it. May we read it every day. It can seem sometimes like an archaic book that it cannot speak to our lives, but God, your spirit, is, your spirit and your word are alive and they're powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. God, use your spirit and your word to make us into courageous and bold witnesses of Jesus and what he's done in our lives. God, use this church. Use us in the lives of those around us. Help us not to be ashamed of what Jesus has done for us. Help us to be bold and help us to call people to follow him, to repent and believe in him so that they can receive that spirit of truth so they don't have to go around in fear and in confusion, but they can, they can know for certain where they're going. They can have hope of eternal life and that they can share in the joy of being followers of Jesus as well. Use us in this way. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Everybody, thank you again for watching this online service today. We just want to remind you that you can go on our website, kmcc.org, and get in contact with us. We would love to be able to talk with you. You can send us an email. You can give us a call, whatever you'd like to do. We'd love to be in touch with you. Also, you can give online on our website at our homepage. There is a give button right there at the top of the page. Click on that. It'll redirect you to a new page that you can give that way, or you can give through the mail, whatever is best for you. Anyway, we just want to thank you again for joining us this morning, and please tune in next week for our next online service. Have a great week.